I've got a tree. What do you reckon? Look at the slack line. Hmm, there's something over here. That's the tricky bit. We'll work that bit out. That'll tax my cerebellum, won't it? It's just like the basal ganglia. Let's talk about the cerebellum in the same manner. Now, I was going to say the cerebellum is fun because the cerebellum is one of those structures that lets me do all the fun things that I like doing. I spend a lot of time working on my cerebellum. My cerebellum spends a lot of time working with me. <laughs> but as I've tried to distill this down into something right for what I think my audience is, I've been reminded why I've been putting off this video forever. We'll do the same thing as we did for the basal ganglia. We'll introduce the cerebellum as I would normally introduce it if it comes up in a topic. We will look at the anatomy, the lumps and bumps, the parts of the cerebellum, but this in itself is very difficult. So it's going to kind of be an overview. I'll see what photos I've got. And um, we'll talk about the blood supply of the cerebellum. I can deal with that. That's important and very helpful. We'll talk about um, some of the wiring, but only a little bit. And at that point, that will be your jumping off point to take this to neuroscientists. And when they chuck a lot of terms at you, when they're trying to talk about the wiring, you'll understand them a bit better because I'll have described the lumps and bumps. Uh, and then we'll talk about what happens when it gets injured, right? Okay, favourite facts about the cerebellum. Cerebellum means little brain. That's kind of cool. If you look at it, it does kind of look like a little cerebrum. And that's important. Don't mix up the terms cerebrum and cerebellum because I do frequently, or rather my mouth does, even if my brain doesn't. Um, it has the same number of neurons-ish as the rest of the central nervous system in its entirety, right? It's probably got about 70 billion neurons. It's got the same number of neurons as the rest of the central nervous system. Isn't that nuts? And that fact gives you a clue as to its complexity <laughs> and its importance. The fact that it's got so many neurons also kind of explains the structure. I mean, look at it. The reason it looks like a little brain is because it's got lots of little folds. The cerebrum's got big folds, gyri and sulky, and the cerebellum has got lots of little folds. All those little folds, whenever we see little folds, what does it give that organ? It gives it a lot of surface area. So, I mean, Generally speaking, we see the grey matter around the outside, the nerve cell bodies, and then the white matter, the axons surrounded by myelin, run away from the edges to wherever they're going to, or vice versa. So those little folds give lots of surface area, so lots and lots of neurons. Why do I describe the cerebellum as the fun area of the brain? Well, a lot of what we were talking about with the basal ganglia also applies to the cerebellum. All these systems are linked up and they use each other. Now, look at my uh, swim stroke and look at my golf stroke. They're incredibly complicated movements that took me years and years and years to learn, bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, and then think about walking. Think about the movements I'm making to make speech, the coordination of all these different parts. It's incredibly complicated. And yet, if I don't play golf for a year or even two years, I'm actually pretty confident I can rock up with me dad to the first tee and hit the ball after a little bit of a warm up maybe. And I can, I can hit the ball. That incredibly complicated movement is still there. That's the cerebellum. Your handwriting, your signature, your dance moves, all of those complicated movements, all those sequences that you've learned are stored in your cerebellum. So the cerebellum is a place of, of motor learning. It's a place of motor coordination. So it's modulating the motor stuff that's going past. We've talked about the basal ganglia doing similar things to let us make complicated movements from similar ideas. The cerebellum is, a, is also, it's, it's key to that. And very important to me again these days in the last few years is um, it's also tied into the vestibular system so it's important in balance now if you think about rock climbing which uses like I mean balance movement I'm learning movement I'm learning all those things it's all cerebellum so it's the cerebellum and lots of other bits and bobs but it's the cerebellum that lets me do 
the things on the climbing wall, on the rock, on the boulder that I enjoy doing so much. And the movements that I learn through training, they get stored in the cerebellum. So the more I learn, the better I get, and that learning doesn't really go away. This is what we mean by muscle memory. Muscle memory has taken on a new idea recently in that there is some memory in how how strong a muscle got and stuff like that. But the, the, early, the original term, the, the early idea, as far as I understand it, muscle memory, as in you learning a movement, that's the cerebellum. Coordination, balance, posture, it's all the cerebellum. Have you ever considered how your eyes move? And how you can remain focused on something as you move your head? Cerebellum. Okay, neuroanatomy. That is the lumpy bumpy bits, the tangible things that we can poke and see. My description is going to be a little bit limited partly because I haven't got one here to poke at. So I'm going to make best use of images that I can find because it's the COVID thing, right? So I can't go into work and I'm in my back garden. And also, um, how much do you need to know about the lumpy bumpy bits? The deeper you go, the more complicated and confusing it gets. Structural features. The cerebellum has three pairs of peduncles, stalks, that connect it to the brainstem. The superior peduncle connects to the midbrain. The middle peduncle connects to the pons. The inferior peduncle connects to the medulla oblongata. So these are the cerebellar peduncles. There are also cerebral peduncles going to the cerebrum. Those uh, cerebellar peduncles are going to be white matter because they're bundles of neurons running to and from the cerebellum via the brainstem then. That's an important idea. Um, and they're surrounded by myelin, so they're kind of white connecting stalks. Ah, now the really cool thing is, if you consider the midbrain, the pons and the medulla, and you consider the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, we've seen spaces, there are spaces inside the brain that cerebrospinal fluid is made in and passes through, right? The, the ventricles, we have the two lateral ventricles, the third ventricle in the midline, the cerebral aqueduct, and then the fourth ventricle, that fourth ventricle, it's shaped like that because it is the space between, largely, the pons and the cerebellar peduncles. So the cerebellum is, is mostly posterior to the pons, and it lies in what we might describe as the posterior uh, fossa of the three cranial fossae. That is a little in the skull, the anterior, middle and posterior cranial fossa. And the cerebellum is, again, it's surrounded by dura mater, like other parts of the brain, and the tentorium cerebelli are two sheets of um, dura mater that form, it's like a tent, tentorium cerebelli, um, sheets, oh, they separate the cerebellum from the cerebrum, leaving just kind of a small hole for the midbrain to pass through. Okay, so what are the obvious features of the cerebellum that we can see? Right, well, it has left and right hemispheres, like the cerebrum, left and right cerebellar hemispheres, so left and right halves, and it has a corpus, corpus cerebelli, um, the body, um, on each side. Now the centre is the, the vermis, vermis meaning worm, right? So the vermis is like the midline part of the cerebellum, linking the left and right cerebellar hemispheres. And the body, the corpus, has two lobes. There's an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. And then there's a separate flocculonodular lobe, inferior to all of this. There are big fissures and little fissures, but the anterior and posterior lobes are separated by the primary fissure. And then the body, which is the anterior and the posterior lobe together, is separated from the flocculonodular lobe by the posterolateral fissure. Those are the big bits that you can usually point at and poke on a life-sized cerebellum. There are also functional regions. So running superior to inferiorly, so running that direction, right? We have the vermis again in the midline as one of these longitudinal functional zones and then next to it is a medial zone so then which is kind of a thin strip and then lateral to that is the rest of the cerebellum which is the lateral zone that kind of makes sense that's all right isn't it 
vernus medial lateral zones but they're more functional things collections of neurons rather than physical things that we can easily see and point at that's kind of as far as i would go as structural parts me personally you can go deeper um it gets described like bits of the mouth you've got the lingula and the uvula but you've also got chunks described by Ro as Ro uh, described with roman numerals and things like that Another common structural thing that's talked about are the deep nuclei. So if you've got each cerebellar hemisphere, one on either side, in, if, if the outer part is the cortex and the inner part is the medulla, don't get confused with the medulla oblongata, we're talking about the medulla, the central part of the cerebellar hemisphere, in there are deep nuclei. There are lots of nuclei, they've got lots of great names, I'll leave that magic for the neuroscientists, but that's what they mean by the deep nuclei. They mean these collections of nuclei, collections of neuronal cell bodies in the medulla, in the central part of the cerebellar hemisphere. All right. Oh, one thing that would be useful is uh, the tonsils. Have you heard of the cerebellar tonsils? You might have done, particularly if you're uh, studying clinical stuff, because the cerebellar tonsils are pretty much the, the, the inferior most bit of the cerebellum and... Um, nearby then is the foramen magnum, the big hole in the base of the floor of the skull. Through there passes the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord. But because the cerebellum is in a limited space because of that, that tentorium cerebelli, that dura mater, so it's in like a restricted space in the posterior fossa, if if something starts growing in that posterior fossa and starts pushing the cerebellum, you know, as in there's only one way to push everything, well, there's two ways to push everything. One is up uh, towards the cerebrum and one is down through the foramen magnum. And that's what tends to happen is um, you can get a herniation of the cerebellar tonsils kind of down through the foramen magnum but what what's really happening here is the cerebellar tonsils start compressing the medulla oblongata that's not good because the medulla oblongata and the pons they hold really old centers that are vital for life you know respiration control of the heart rate and that sort of thing so when you start compressing the medulla oblongata it's very very dangerous and often results in death so the cerebellar tonsils often come up clinically for that reason right blood supply i'm on i'm on the firmer ground now um okay so the blood supply to the cerebellum is important because um we're probably most used to the idea of uh, an mca stroke uh a clot occluding uh the middle cerebral artery on one side but of course you can also get occlusions of the blood vessels supplying the cerebellum and you can get a stroke in different parts of the brain okay what am i talking about right well Blood is supplied to the brain through four major arteries. You have the internal carotid artery on either side, left and right. Then you have the two vertebral arteries running up with the, verte the uh, cervical vertebrae on either side. Two vertebral arteries, one left, one right, pass into the cranial cavity through foramen magnum and they join together to form the basilar artery. And the basilar artery runs between the skull, the clevis of the skull, the bony bit, between that and the brain stem, medulla oblongata, pons, midbrain, uh, supplying blood as it goes, and then the basilar artery ends as the left and right posterior cerebral arteries, which supply blood largely to the posterior parts of the brain, and they link up with the other blood vessels to form the circle of Willis. So, how does the cerebellum fit into all this? This stuff is sensibly named. There are three pairs of arteries supplying blood to the cerebellum. Um, and they'll supply different parts of the cerebellum. The first pair, if we're going from inferior to superior, are the posterior, inferior, cerebellar arteries. And they actually usually branch from the vertebral arteries. So these are branching before the basilar artery has formed. That's the posterior, inferior cerebellar, cerebellar arteries. And as we ascend, the second pair are the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. All right, so that's another pair that run off. And those come from the basilar artery and run around the cerebellum supplying it with blood. Can you work out what the third pair are going to be named? 
The third pair are the superior cerebellar arteries and they branch from the basilar artery just before it ends. So they're right next to the posterior cerebral arteries. So those superior cerebellar arteries then run around kind of the superior part of the cerebellum. Cool and useful fact, the labyrinthine artery is usually a branch of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Labyrinthine artery, now where's that gonna go? Clues in the name. It runs into the internal auditory meatus and it's gonna supply blood to the labyrinth. It's gonna supply blood to the structures of the inner ear. So, if that artery gets occluded on one side, it's gonna have effects on usually balance, possibly hearing. Okay, wiring. This is where it gets messy and we start to cross over to the neuroscientists. Um, a lot of tracks run past the cerebellum. If, if it's got cerebello or cerebella in its name, it's going to or from the cerebellum. So if it's, if it's a spinocerebella, it's going from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. If it's, um, if it's got cerebello in the first part, then it's going from the cerebellum to something else. All right, so what does it connect to? There are tracks running into the cerebellum from the vestibular nuclei, from the spinal cord, from the cerebral cortex via the pons uh, and from the reticular formation. So um, vestibular, we talked about, that's balance. Um, yeah, the connections, well, connections with the spinal cord, they're, they're modulating motor stuff that's going past. So that's relating to the stuff we were talking about before, coordinating movement. Um, and obviously it's then involved in balance and balance and movement and posture. These are all tied together by the cerebellum. Um, there seem to be other functions relating to the cerebrum, cognitive stuff, which are not understood yet. Much of this wiring isn't fully understood yet. The reticular formation. So the reticular formation tends to be involved in um, arousal, arousal, you know, consciousness, um, uh, being asleep and awake, that sort of thing. These tracks are going to have lots of names, but they're going to be... They're going to include vestibulocerebellar tracts, spinocerebellar tracts, reticulocerebellar tracts, you see what I mean? But there will be others. But look in the name for the clues as to where it goes. Might not tell you what it does though, because they might not know yet. Where does it send connections out to? Um, kind of everywhere. It sends outputs to the vestibular nuclei again, to the red nucleus, which is in the, it's in the midbrain, it's near the substantia nigra, it seems to be involved in movements of the upper limb. It sends connections out to the olivary nuclei, which aren't entirely understood, but again are involved in, in movement, probably mo modulating motor tracts and that sort of thing. It sends stuff out to the thalamus, which is like the sensory sieve, all your sensory stuff goes into the thalamus, the thalamus kind of decides what to send off to your higher levels, right? So it's Mm, but that's interesting, the tie-in to the thalamus, we'll come back to that. Also sends outputs back to the reticular formation and to lots of other places as well. And again, there's a lot of wiring that's kind of been mapped out, but it's, it's not understood. It's, it's there, but it's not understood. That's the beauty of neuroscience, right? Now the eyes are very special. There's a lot of anatomy in here, um, but there's more to it than that. I mean, look at, it's so easy, isn't it, to, to keep your eyes on something. So um, there's a region in, in the retina, the fovea or the macula, which is like your high def bit. And everything else around here is a little bit blurry. But right here, it's super in focus. And when you're looking at something, you keep that super high res part of your retina on the thing that you're actually looking at. This is the cerebellum. There are loads of automatic movements of the eyes that we take for granted. Um, so we've got this this thing here, right? And of course, imagine that this is the vestibular ocular, ocular reflex, amongst other things, in that we talked about how the vestibular system ties into the cerebellum, and the muscles of the eyes tie into the cerebellum. The visual stuff that's going in ties into the, the thalamus, and the cerebellum ties into the thalamus and so on and so on. And what this lets us do then is when we're walking, when we're moving, when we're running, when we're just looking at a camera, it's very easy for us to keep our eye on our target as we move our head because the semicircular canals are giving the cerebellum movement uh, information about how we're moving our head and this is then 
um, feeding back to the movements of the eyes so we can keep our our fovea focused on whatever it is that we're looking at. The cerebellum is not responsible for this, this is a separate reflex set of neurons outside the cerebellum, but the cerebellum has important roles in modulating this. More than this though, what about saccadic eye movements? Saccades, so saccades are kind of the quick movements you make with your eye, going from one thing to another. Um, one of my favourite examples of saccadic eye movements is, is when we look at a face. So because we've got this one high def part of the retina, we can't just look at a scene and take that whole scene in in one go. Our eyes move around, don't they, to look at the different parts of the thing to build up an entire picture. We don't notice we're doing this. And these are also saccadic eye movements. So when you look at a face, particularly a new face, you'll look from eye to eye to eye to eye to eye. Your eyes will flick from one eye to the other. And then you'll dip down to look at the mouth, eye, eye, mouth, eye, eye, mouth. And then you'll grow to add the chin and the brow and the nose and other details of the face. Your eyes will just flick around that face as you're talking to this person. And your brain will build up a picture of that face. So that's the crux of it. Very similar to the basal ganglia but uh, much more about motor learning, learning complex movements, storing those complex movements for the future so you can reproduce them. If different parts of the cerebellum are injured, different functions are going to be lost or different signs or symptoms are going to be, are going to be seen. But that's quite rare. Um, I know a lot of neuroscience papers refer back to um, World War I soldiers who had damage to their cerebellums uh, and um, a neuro guy wrote down a lot of what, what they experienced and what he observed. And um, it is, as you would expect, problems with balance, a kind of like a staggering gait. Um, and just like the basal ganglia, difficulty in making fine movements, but also overshooting a target or undershooting a target, not quite, you know, picking up the glass, but, but reaching too far and knocking it over or not quite getting far enough. Those are signs of cerebellar dysfunction. But also as you're reaching for that object, um, an intention tremor as you get close to an object, as you try to fine tune that movement uh, might be seen. So ataxia, um, that coordination of movements, uh, that sort of thing. So very much balance and coordination. Eye movements can be affected, but you know, specific parts of the cerebellum have to be damaged for eye movements to be affected. You might also see um, a reduction in muscle tone. You might see um, hyporeflexia. So um, reflexes, might, reflexes <laughs> might be depressed a little bit. So that's the cerebellum. Not my finest work, but I'm, I'm working with um, what I have available to me. And hopefully, I mean, that, that is how I would pitch the anatomy of the cerebellum to groups of first or second year medical students, to physician associate students. It's maybe a little bit, I don't know, a little bit variable, but that, that's it. That, that, that gets a lot of the core and co ideas across, the core structures across, and then you can leap off that into the world of neuroscience and let the neuroscientists give you a whole bunch of other terms. Don't get too confused by their terms because you will read more than one term for the same structure. So I, it, 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 it's just difficult. I, I can't make it easy it is just difficult and again like much of neuroscience it's still being worked out which is part of the excitement but the cerebellum is very important to me as a climber as a cyclist as a runner as as a human being that likes to move <laughs> and enjoys balance um so one of the reasons i wear a helmet <laughs> i just like my brain generally my brain's kind of kind of important to me anyway right enough rambling this might be a long one i guess uh See you guys next week, maybe.